Should I epoxy coat wood? This is a question that has long divided boat builders and woodworkers. No. Yes, you no, should. No. And most either love it or hate it. I believe that this is a somewhat misunderstood process which often leads to improper use and ultimately issues or even failure down the line. So in this video I am cautiously taken on the subject in the hopes that I can give you all the information you might need in order to make an informed decision as to whether or not this process might work for your application. In making that decision, there are a number of factors that you should take into consideration. We're going to look through the top three of these, and alongside that, we'll discuss some of the key properties of epoxy and understand its role within coating wood. The three main factors we are going to consider are 1. Flexibility and expansion. 2. Moisture resistance. and 3. UV resistance. As we learn about these key properties, we'll do some tests here at the workshop, we'll look at the science behind what epoxy actually does, and we'll take a trip to Wessex Resins, the home of epoxy here in the UK, to see how this stuff is made, tested, and developed. So let's start at the beginning. What is epoxy? Epoxy is the family of basic components or cured end products of epoxy resins. Epoxy resins also known as Okay, I'll try and keep things interesting. It's a plastic, a thermoset plastic to be precise. One that is formed by the mixing of two components. By combining a resin and hardener, we can form a mixed epoxy that can be used for bonding, coating, casting, and a variety of different processes within wood and composites work. For the purposes of coating wood, which is what we're talking about here, West System make an epoxy specifically for this purpose, which is produced by combining their 105 resin and 207 special clear hardener. So let's head off to Wessex Resins and take a look at how this stuff gets made. Now there is a top secret formula that goes into making West System Epoxy. It ensures that it has repeated consistency in colour and performance and it's really much like that secret herb and spices blend on your favourite brand of fried chicken. Now it should go without saying that the West System Epoxy actually has nothing to do with fried chicken or food at all for that matter but the point here is two of these things are very well kept secret recipes. Lovely. Right, off to Wessex Resins. As we arrive at the epoxy headquarters, here we can see where the raw material for epoxy resin comes in and is stored 40,000 litres at a time. Heading into reception, you will see many examples of manufacturing excellence on display, from modern wooden constructions to cutting edge composites work onwards out into the factory and there are towers of ingredients neatly stored ready for blending. One thing you'll notice in this factory is that there is next to no smell. No solvents are used within these epoxies and that's part of what makes them do what they do so well. We'll take a look at just why that is later on in the video. Here we see the giant vats where resin is blended in batches of five tons at a time. So, if you've ever thought that you've had a bad batch tin, there is no such thing. Each five ton batch is meticulously sampled and approved before dispatch. That's probably more than I use in my lifetime and certainly enough to fill a fair few of these APAC resin tins that are patiently waiting to be filled. Speaking of filling, onto the machine that does that work. Tin lids vibrate themselves satisfyingly upwards around a spiral that rejects the upside down ones and lets the right way up ones pass through. These then feed into a spinny on device that is the next stop in the line after the resin is filled to a precise weight. On down the conveyor at a rate of knots and labels are applied. One final check for condition of the tins and they are stacked up ready to go out the door to boat builders and enthusiasts all over the world. 
With the factory tour complete, the stuff I really went there for is the sciencey bit. And it just so happens that upstairs there is a training room and a lab where a range of tests are regularly carried out on the products to ensure that they meet all the desired specifications. Highly technical and expensive looking machines form a test bed for a multitude of epoxies properties. So on to looking at the first factor to consider, flexibility and expansion. One of the most common statements I hear is, epoxy is too hard, it does not move with the wood and it will crack. Okay, so exactly how much does this epoxy extend? When will it crack and when are you most likely to see a failure? This is something that you'll need to know before deciding whether or not to use it for your coating application. Luckily, this is a property that is extensively tested by West System, so we can get a definitive answer to this. To get that answer, we head over to their tensile elongation testing machine. This machine stretches a cast epoxy coupon and records its extension rate against the force needed to stretch it until its point of failure. This means we can gain definitive data on exactly how much it extends and when it begins to fail, so we know the exact point at which irreversible damage begins to happen and its point of complete failure. The tensile elongation of the West System Special Clear Epoxy is 3.2%. Okay, but what does that actually mean in real money? It means that it can extend by up to 3.2% before irreversible damage will begin to happen. In physical form, take a look at this piece of wood. This is 100 mm square. If this were coated with epoxy, it would need to expand to 103.2 mm in size before a failure would start to occur in the surface. In everyday seasonal expansion and contraction of timber, there are very few scenarios in which you are likely to see that rate of expansion, particularly if water ingress and therefore moisture content fluctuations are limited by the encapsulation process. We'll take a look at encapsulation when we get into the next key factor. So where do all these failures come from? Well, the point at which you are actually far more likely to see a failure occur is not across the surface of the wood, but in joints and seams. So we know our epoxy can handle an elongation of 3.2%, capable of stretching by 3.2 millimeters in every 100 millimeters before it begins to fail. But consider that epoxy spanning a moving plank seam on a boat. If that seam is even as much as one millimeter wide, that dimension can only increase to 1.032 millimeters before you could see a failure there. That is a small tolerance and many wooden boat constructions will see expansion and contraction in these areas far exceeding this number. This is the most common cause of failure within an epoxy coating scenario. Cracks that form at seams and joints where movement of the surrounding timber is taken up within a small concentrated area. Constructions that experience this type of movement are an example of where this process should not be used. Cracks at plank seams could lead to water ingress, moisture entrapment, which we'll look at in a bit, and potentially rotten failure. There are more flexible epoxy products available, such as West Systems G-Flex, which can exhibit elongation properties of up to 30%, but that's an aside, and maybe we'll cover that in a separate video. For that reason, this process should only be used in cases where there is dimensional stability within the surface, and most importantly, the joints. For example, cold molded, glued clinker, or glued strip plank constructions, just to name a few. Instances where physical flexing of the substrate will not cause seams to expand and contract by a factor that exceeds the tensile elongation rating of the epoxy. 
Plywood constructions can also be considered dimensionally stable, providing that joints are done using good working practice with sufficient glue surface area, such as appropriately sized scarf joints. Unsupported butt joints or short glue lines are likely to see movement outside of our tolerance window and could therefore crack over time. Coating of solid single section timbers is okay, providing that they don't do too much work within their everyday application. For example, a well-supported capping or handrail on a yacht would be fine. Coating timbers such as spars that are working or flexing heavily within their everyday operations could be risky. So if you are considering coating a working piece of wood, have a think about how likely it is to exceed or even come close to the elongation figures I've just mentioned. Or more importantly, if it has working joints that are likely to experience concentrated movement like the examples we've just seen. Next, let's move on to the second key factor that we need to consider, moisture resistance. Perhaps the single biggest benefit in using epoxy within a wood coating application is its incredible resistance to the ingress of moisture, making it a perfect candidate for unparalleled protection from water and oils, for example. But why is that? In the factory tour, I mentioned the lack of solvent smell. Well, the West System Epoxy is a solvent-free product, perhaps one of very few products as most that we use for coating within the boat building industry usually contain a solvent of some sort. As a solvented product such as a paint or varnish cures, its solvents evaporate. As this happens, microscopic tracks or a network of galleries are created and left behind by the solvent. These create porosity within the surface and cause shrinkage of the finish over time as these tracks collapse. These channels that are left behind can facilitate moisture ingress through the coating. This is the reason that you need to limit the speed and film thickness at which you can build up coats of a solvented product such as a two-part clear varnish. Application too quickly can cover up these solvent tracks and prevent proper release. Solvent entrapment, as we know it, is not good for the finish long term. Solvent-free epoxy does not suffer from this issue and can therefore be built in greater film thicknesses, creating a substantial barrier coat and filling wood grain quickly, rapidly increasing the speed at which finished systems can be built. The detrimental effect of solvent tracks within the finish is one of the key reasons that the thinning of epoxy with acetone or any solvent for that matter is not recommended. By doing this you are undoing one of the most prominent performance properties delivered by the product. Introducing solvent creates porosity and weakens the final product. Sure you may get a better flow, absorption and finish but it is at the compromise of strength and moisture resistance. If you need to thin epoxy, it is recommended that you do this process only by warming it to reduce its viscosity and not adding a solvent and therefore compromising its chemical makeup. There are solvented epoxy products on the market and they do have their place. However, consider that for this reason, their moisture resistant properties are significantly reduced in comparison to an unsolvented product. Here we can see the effects of moisture exclusion tests that were done by the Goujon brothers to compare the exclusion effectiveness of various different types of coating systems. If you'd like to take a look at that study, I will put the link in the description below this video. Okay, so we know epoxy can create an incredibly impermeable barrier. So how can we use that to our advantage? Well, by encapsulating wood, we can see a number of benefits, namely the exclusion of moisture and oxygen transfer. When wood takes on moisture, it wants to do several things, gain in weight and physically expand, often resulting in warping as well. And long-term, if the right conditions are maintained, which are sustained levels of moisture and oxygen, it can proceed to rot. Epoxy, if used in the right way, can prevent these symptoms from happening by creating a barrier, preventing water ingress and limiting fluctuations in the wood's moisture content levels. But if it's used incorrectly, by equal measure, the epoxy can trap moisture within the surface of the wood, preventing its release and rapidly accelerating potential issues such as rot, as the water is unable to escape from within the wood. Consider this example. 
you do the washing up with your bare hands. Your hands get wet and once you've finished, they slowly dry out again. That's the equivalent of an uncoated piece of wood. Now consider doing the washing up with your gloves on. Your hands never get wet at all, but if water gets down inside the glove and you then walk around with the gloves on for the next six months, your hands will never properly dry out. You can imagine what they would look like. This is the equivalent of a partially coated or poorly encapsulated piece of wood. Now consider doing the washing up with a full dry suit on. Okay, I didn't have a dry suit for this shot, but consider you would be completely sealed on all sides from any possible water ingress. This is the approach that we are wanting to take with proper and thorough encapsulation of wood with no single open point for ingress. This even includes screw holes. Let's take a look at some samples of wood coated in the same three ways we've just looked at that have spent several weeks immersed in water to see the difference in their moisture content levels and weights. So we have four pieces of timber for this experiment. I'm using white oak here as that is probably one of the most unstable woods with regards to movement. So what we've got here is four pieces of wood that were all cut from the same length so they are exactly the same piece of timber, there is no variation, there is no sapwood in um, one piece and not the other. So it's a nice equal experiment. Now what you can see here is that we've got one piece that is completely uncoated. We've got one piece that is coated on all faces with just the end grain left exposed. We've got one piece that is coated on all faces but just has a small hole drilled into the center of it. And we've got one piece that is completely encapsulated, closed on all sides. Now before these get immersed in the water, I'm taking measurements of all the pieces of timber. So we've got a log here of the dimension across the width of the timber because that is the direction in which this is going to expand as it takes on moisture. I'm also checking the moisture content level of the timber. Now this is a little bit higher than I would uh, normally recommend for encapsulation, but for just the purposes of this test, 13.4% doesn't really matter to us. I'm also weighing each timber before we put them into the water so that we can have a really good accurate monitor of exactly how much water this timber has absorbed in each of the different scenarios. So once we've gathered all of that data to begin with, all of the pieces of timber go into a bucket of water. I'm then using a stone placed on the top of them to keep these pieces fully submersed and we will leave them there for several weeks and then come back and revisit them. Okay, so we are probably about six, maybe even as much as eight weeks on from the pieces of timber going in this bucket. I've lost track a little bit, but I think they've been in there plenty of time for us to see what's going on. So let's get them out. Now I'm going to wipe all the pieces of timber off just to get any excess water off the outside of them. That's hopefully going to give us a nice accurate representation on the, uh, the weight test as to what is actually within the surface and not just clinging onto the outside. So we'll get them dried. Okay, and we can see some immediate visual um, differences from when they went in several weeks ago. So let's take a look at those individually. Okay, so first of all, you can see that uh, the bare wood one is significantly blackened. So a lot of discoloration going on with that. You can see some discoloration in the one with the hole in it, which is quite clearly wicked out along the end grain emanating from that hole. And you can see some blackening in the end grain of the opened one as well. We've also got some really noticeable distortions. So you can see on this one where the open end grain is, how much expansion we have on that. And we'll measure that in just a second when we take some dimensions off these and the timber with the hole in it as well I don't know if I can pick this up on camera but there is a significant hump in the middle here where this is expanded in the region of the hole so there's definitely some physical distortion going on with that and our completely coated timber I can't tell until I measure it but it seems to be next to no change at all so let's, um, let's measure them first of all. So we'll go with the bare timber. We had 100.4 millimeters before this went into the water. 
And what we have now is 106.9 millimeters. So around about a 6% expansion on that. So that's pretty large. We've got our timber with the open end. So let's look at the closed end first. And that is a 101.3. So we've got about 1.3% expansion in that. But if we look at this open end, what have we got there? We've got 105. So 5% expansion in the one end that is exposed. So that really shows you the difference there of the moisture coming into the timber in this vicinity. Then we've got our piece with just the hole in. And what do we got? We've got 101.3, so we have got a small amount of expansion in that one, around about 1.3%. Then we've got our completely coated encapsulated timber. What have we got there? We've got 100.8 millimeters. So that is really small expansion rate on that. Could just purely be due, due to uh, thermal expansion. I don't imagine that that has taken on moisture at all. So let's take a look at weights then and we'll see how those compare. Our bare timber then, so this was 111 grams before we put it in the water. We weigh this now and we have 169 grams. So that is gained 58 grams of water within that little piece of timber. That's probably around about 50%, I think. That is a lot of additional weight inside that timber. Then we've got our open-ended timber. So this was 115 grams before we put it in the water. That is now 134. So we've gained 19 grams on that timber. That's a fair amount, just in through that one open end. The timber with the hole in it, that was 116 before. We've now got 122. So that has gained six grams. It's only a small increase, but it's definitely still taking on an inherent weight within that timber there. And then we've got our completely encapsulated timber. So this was 116 grams before we started and we've now got 116 grams. So that hasn't taken on any weight whatsoever with being um, immersed in water for eight weeks. So that's a really good indication that that timber has absorbed no water whatsoever. On to moisture content levels then. And we've got our bare piece of timber first. So we've got 41, 42% moisture. Very damp piece of timber that you wouldn't wanna be trying to bond or paint or do anything at all with that timber. Then we've got our open-ended piece. So I'm actually just gonna test this in the open end and that is 35% moisture. So again, very high in that end. I'll see if I can get through the epoxy here. Yeah, and we've got 14.9% down in the lower end. So you can see that that's limited um, the travel of the moisture. It's obviously not gone all the way through into this timber, but um, we've got significant distortion and damage to that one end. Then we've got our timber with the hole in. So we'll try and get either side of that hole and see what's going on. Forty-two percent thereabouts, so really high again. And if we go over to the edges of that timber, you can see we're um we're still pretty pretty dry over there actually, pretty much the same as um, where we started. So it's done a pretty good job of protecting it. We've really just got a problem in the vicinity of this hole. And then we have our completely encapsulated piece. So if we can get through the epoxy with this. What are we at? 
we are at 13.7%, so very little change at all in that over eight weeks, fully submersed in water. So we can see that based on that experiment, even the slightest open point that will allow for the ingress of moisture can create problems. This shows you that proper encapsulation of the timber is a job that needs to be done thoroughly and meticulously with no stone left unturned. It is worth noting that coating and encapsulation are two slightly different approaches. You can coat the surface of wood without needing to completely encapsulate it, allowing it to breathe through its uncoated side. And in certain scenarios such as restoration work, this method is advised as complete and thorough encapsulation may not be feasible. Just imagine trying to completely seal every timber and rivet hole on a traditional clinker dinghy. It's highly unlikely that you'll be able to do that. For new build glue constructions, however, parts can be encapsulated prior to installation, and therefore this method is far more achievable in these cases. As a general rule of thumb, aim for encapsulation with new build boats and coating within restoration work. However, alongside the coating process, you should ensure that this scenario satisfies a couple of factors. One, that it leaves enough breathable surface for moisture to be released at the same rate it is absorbed. And two, that its physical movement across both the wood surface and any joints is not going to exceed the expansion figures we looked at in the earlier part of this video. Proper encapsulation though will help to significantly reduce the effects of both of these things and is the best approach to adopt if you are confident it can be done thoroughly. Also note that the encapsulation process should be done at the correct time. On the same vein of keeping water out, we also don't want to be locking it in. Before encapsulation, timber should be dry, as dry as possible, and ideally at a moisture content level of no more than 12%. So, on to the final key factor to consider, UV protection. All exterior finishes need UV protection regardless of what they are. Everything degrades over time due to the harmful effects of the sun's UV radiation. So how much protection does epoxy need from this and how do we do that? Well, that depends largely on how much exposure it is likely to have on an annual basis. In order to answer that question, we need to look at things such as where does this boat or part live locally? Indoors, undercover, outside or moored up in a harbour 365 days of the year. Then if it is outside, we also need to look at where it lives geographically. In short, the closer it lives to the equator line, the closer it is to the sun. And so the more harmful UV exposure it is going to get year round. The more exposure the epoxy is going to be subjected to year round, the more protection it will need initially, and the more regularly top up coats will need to be applied. The West System 207 Special Clear is developed especially for coating, and therefore it does contain UV inhibitors. That being said, it is recommended that you overcoat the epoxy with a product that is going to give it additional and sufficient UV protection for its expected annual exposure levels. This should be done in the form of a good quality varnish or clear coat. Bear in mind here that I am referring to clear finishes. If you are planning to paint over your epoxy, then the UV protection will be considerably higher due to the increased protection that pigmented paints can offer versus clear coats. Let's take a look at a couple of typical examples that sit at either end of the spectrum. Two boats with epoxy clear coated decks. Boat one is a launch, used occasionally each year. It lives inside a garage for 330 days of the year in darkness with a cover over it. The owner also lives in Norway, up in the Northern Hemisphere, where UV radiation is relatively low. This boat will experience minimal annual UV exposure. And so a system of three epoxy coats, followed by six coats of a two-part clear varnish, may well offer significant protection for this boat for up to 10 years. Boat 2 is the same launch, but its owner lives in Florida. The boat is launched and moored in a marina for half the year. It is left in direct sunlight for this whole period. Being close to the equator, UV radiation would be considered extreme here, and with that level of exposure, the finish system would require serious protection you could expect to have to apply as much as 20 coats of a two-part clear varnish over the epoxy 
to give sufficient initial UV protection and you would need to continue to apply at least a couple of top-up coats each year to maintain this level of protection long term. Those examples really represent either end of the scale, but they should give you some sort of reference. If you are epoxy and clear coating, have a think about the annual level of protection that your project might need. And if you are in doubt, consult the manufacturer of your chosen varnish or clear coat system for guidance. Okay, so three key factors that you should consider in deciding whether or not this process may be suitable for your application. One, flexibility within 3.2% elongation on both surfaces and spanning joints. Two, proper encapsulation as a preference or adequate breathability of the timber. And three, adequate UV protection based on your expected levels of annual exposure. If you can satisfy those factors within your application, then this is the finished system for you. Using this process will give you a seriously quick to apply, low maintenance, highly protective and stable, long lasting finish for wood. So I hope that has built a bit of an understanding if you were looking for clarification on the subject. There is bound to be something that I've missed and there's bound to be somebody that disagrees with what I've said. So good or bad in a constructive manner, please. Let me know in the comments below if you found this video useful. Also let me know if there are any unanswered questions that you might still have on the subject and I'll do my best to answer them or put them to the experts at Wessex Resins if I'm not able. So thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next video. Cheers guys.